There's just something about having like the noise of the water. Like you can, when I'm up in my office, I can just hear this. It's quite therapeutic. I love coming down here and just feeding my fish. They're my little mates, do you know what I mean? They're, um, they've all got their own characters. The chub are really boisterous, the carp are really friendly, the perch are quite friendly, and the bleak and the roach just go about their own thing. But I actually wanted a, a fish tank, and I was telling my mate, I'm gonna buy a fish tank. I want as big as I can get to go in the store, and I wanted to incorporate it into the counter, but um, Adam told me, and no, I make it a feature, so then I was telling my mate about I'm gonna make a feature of a fish tank, which is different, I don't know of any other tackle shop when I was setting this up that had a, a tank of this size. So my very good friend Greg from GH Interior Glass, little plug, he built it for me. And it is a beast. I, I think it took four of us to pick it up and put it on the blocks, but I love it. The water is very murky at the minute because they've been gorging on pellets, but generally it's a lot clearer. And you literally like flies would land here or wherever, and you just watch the chub just come out and smash the flies. It's really interesting. It's just like a, a miniature version of what actually goes on out where we're fishing. Picking up gravel, spitting it out. It's really fascinating to watch. And actually you see like, some fish are quite territorial. Like you watch the chub, and a certain like the tench might go over a rock and the chub are like, nope, get away, and like sort of push them away. So it's really interesting. And the kids love it. And I actually let some of the kids name the fish. I don't know what they're called, I can't remember, but um, they have got some funny names, like the tench is called Bluey. It's green, isn't it? But one of them is named after some sort of uh, SpongeBob thing. I don't even know what it's called, but yeah, it's a, it's a good feature, I think. I think everyone should have a fish tank like this in their life. So when I was 15 at school, I'd done work experience at a place called The Country Way, uh, which was a great shop, predominantly a match fishing shop, but did sell carp fishing gear. There was two of us that went there, one of my best friends, Kenny, and myself, and went there for two weeks. And at the end of the two weeks, the boss pulled me aside and said, listen, don't tell Ken, but would you like a, a Saturday job? And I was like, God, yeah. So I jumped at the chance, and basically I remember I got paid 15 pounds a day, but my bus fare was seven pounds and my lunch was about two pound fifty. So I went there for the love more than for the wages. Obviously the wages were shocking, but that's where it started. So I worked there until as a Saturday boy till I was about 18. Then I started college. Um, design is really my background, quite creative. And I think I was about 19 or 20. No, I was 20 years old and my boss at the time, my manager, he was leaving. Funnily enough, he went to become a representative for leader. So my governors dangled the carrot and said, you want to come and work here? And here's some lots of money and blah, 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 blah. So it was fantastic. I dropped out of college, um, but went in to work in the shop full time. I ended up staying there for a few years and got, I wouldn't say bored of it, but just sort of had enough and wanted more. So I decided to jack everything in sell up my, my car and all that and, and go traveling around the world. So I backpacked everywhere, uh, which was a great life experience. Obviously loads of fishing involved as well. I had no intention of going back in the fishing trade. I wanted to start afresh, maybe go back into design because that is, that is another passion of mine, drawing and stuff like that. And literally the day I landed, so I've just flown in from Thailand. I landed at seven o'clock in the morning. My parents picked me up from the airport with my long hair and my hippie trousers and all that. And uh, I remember I walked in the door and literally five past nine, the phone rang and it was my old boss. And she was like, look, can you come back? Because they had a few departments to their shop, guns, country clothing. That's, that's where their strengths were. But the fishing, they didn't know much about fishing. And the guys that were in charge wasn't doing as good a job as they should be. So that's why I come back, 
try and sort the shop out and turn it around. And originally I went back to the shop, say for six months, I said, look, I'm gonna come back, help turn it around again. Um, and I ended up staying there for another few more years. And eventually I just thought, I'm just back in the same rut. So I worked, had a nice break, loads of life lessons, and then I'm back to where I started again. So I decided to leave, I decided to quit, and I handed my notice in, my heart wasn't in it. I love working there and I love selling, and obviously I, I, I love the job, but it was for somebody else and I really felt that I needed to do something for myself. So randomly on eBay, after I'd left work, so this was like December, I then had January, which is a horrible month to have off because it's cold, it's miserable, it's gloomy. I was on eBay just trolling through and I found a shop for sale up in Doncaster. The guy just closed the shop and he just had the stock. And uh, I thought, I'm gonna have a punt at that. And I had no money, like nothing. Um, I was helping my dad with a bit of labouring work for a bit of cash in hand or whatever. So I'd done a bit of a naughty and I, I got in touch with a loan company. I used my old previous bank statements to say that I was still employed full time because I knew I could flip it. I knew I could buy the gear and sell it on for a good profit. So yeah, I got given this loan and then yeah, jumped in a van, drove all the way up to Doncaster, wedged the guy out with a load of cash and had loads and loads of stock, like random stuff, not just cart fishing, all different types. And then um, I had nowhere to put it. So I literally just brought it back home and then my bedroom become like, you open the door and you're like shimmying in, you know, it's just boxes galore. And I had a lot of friends, obviously, from working in a tackle shop. I had a lot of my friends were going fishing. So obviously I sold to them. Um, and then I just started selling on eBay. And then one thing led to another. I brought another shop out, which is down on the south coast. Um, I had a couple of other things come to me. So I had a really fantastic life for a couple of years. I literally, in two years, I had a lot of holidays, but I'm, I'm missing a point actually. I remember I was actually on a holiday in, in Spain. My mate rings me up and said, there's a really good shop up for grabs. It's got you all over it. And I was right, right, let me phone the girl when I'm, when I'm back. So I phoned a lady who worked at the administration company and she said, yeah, we've got this shop, big shop. It's a well-known tackle shop, I won't say the name. It's a big shop. Um, it, it was like an Aladdin's cave. She, she sort of gave me some sort of itinerary of what was there. And I was like, I've got to come up and see this. So I met the lady drove up to the to the shop, opened this door, and it was just like a f like fully kitted out, mental tackle shop with everything you can imagine. Like, like this, but on a smaller scale, it had everything. And I was like, this is gonna be big money. Let's see what she comes up with. Anyway, she gave me the sort of rough ballpark figure of what it was sort of worth. So I was like, yeah, this is, this is my offer. And uh, she said, right, okay, what I'm gonna do is go back to the other people who put sort of bids in and then see what they come back with, and then you can sort of counter offer. And I was just like, I'm not gonna play that game. So I'm here now, you tell me how much you want to secure this because I want it. And she went, if you give me a hundred pounds more, it's yours. And I was just like, yeah, I'm sure I can stretch to a hundred quid. She said, terms and conditions are, you gotta have the money uh, in full and the whole place got to be emptied in seven days. And this was just like my dream. I just got everything I wanted. So three vans went up there, big Luton vans. We, we had everything. We had racking, we had tills, we had security cameras, we had stock like you wouldn't believe. Everything you can imagine, fridges, freezers, it was all ours. So obviously I couldn't fit in my bedroom anymore. So in the meantime, I spoke to my friend who's got a scrap yard. He had this big lock up, we'd agreed a deal, like this, you know, probably half the size of my shop now. And we just set it up like a shop and just loaded it up. And that's when I had fun for another two years. I lived off the back of that for about two years. I had 24 holidays in two years. I used to go to France fishing loads of public waters, go to Belgium fishing the rivers out there. It was just fantastic. I was actually working, I had a laptop that I would take to the lake and I was fishing a local park lake for two nights a week and then a local club lake for two nights a week. So that was the time I was doing four nights a week. I could reply to all my emails, jot home in between, package all my parcels, send them out. It was absolutely fantastic. But obviously the gear was gonna run out. And although I earned a lot of money on that, there was nothing else coming through. I think all the bigger companies were then snapping up all the shops that went into administration. So I was just like, man, I've had a great couple of years, done a lot of fishing, 
spent all my money, have no money left, and now I'm back to, to square one. So I was like, I've got to bite the bullet, and I think it's time now to grow up. I think I was 28, got to grow up and, and do something proper with my life. So there was a, an office building near where I lived at my parents, and um, it, I thought I could turn that into a fishing shop. I've got some stock, I've got all the racking, I've got all the fixing and fittings. I know everybody in the trade. I should be able to get some accounts. I'm a grafter. Let's, let's give it a go. And the reality is I was way out of my depth. I didn't have any money at all because I've spent it all on all these holidays all the time. Um, I didn't, my stock that I had left wasn't fantastic, but I just literally called in loads of favours and spoke to a lot of tackle companies, a lot of manufacturers, promised the earth, had missions getting some accounts because of, you know, other shops in the area and all that. But yeah, eventually on uh, August the 5th, I opened my store. It was a mission to open it because it was an office and I had to go through the council to get change of use, you know, standard. And um, yeah, I'm so glad I did. And I remember getting this shop, it was 901 square foot. I remember opening the door, looking at it with the, with the agent and going, it's gonna be perfect, but how the hell am I gonna fill this up? And then within three months, the shop was rammed and we had to knock down two walls and make it bigger. And then it's just been progression from there. I've become very comfortable in my shop life. We got to a certain size. We couldn't get any bigger because of the size of the store. And my shop was, you know, the expression, you can't see the wood for the trees. We had gear everywhere. I then ended up getting a container, which I put outside to take more stock. And eventually to get something, you'd have to crawl on top of boxes to crawl to the back to get it. It was a nightmare, but it was my life. It's how we done it. Um, and I've become very comfortable. So you imagine, I used to go fishing a lot before I had the store. And then when I had my store, all I done was work. My fishing was proper on the back burner. You couldn't, even when you did go fishing, you could never fish effectively because your mind's not on your fishing. Your mind is on your business because all of a sudden that's your bread and butter. I've got loads of money now tied up into it with stock and you've got to make it work. So my, my progression to go forward was more forced. I actually had a plan to, stay in my old shop, um, which I loved, um, with the two guys that worked with me, doing the same sort of turnover, just nice and comfortable, plodding along. I wouldn't say I was ambitious for more. I didn't have much more of a drive. Of course, you always want to earn more money, but I become comfortable. I started to get a bit of my life back, started to go on holidays again, started to go fishing a little bit more. And I thought I could just roll this out. And my actual plan was to roll it out for five more years, I had first refusal on the building from the lady who owned the building. And I was gonna buy that building and then develop on the building and then sell up happy days. But someone beat me to it. So all of a sudden, I got a phone call from my landlady and she said, look, we need to have a chat. And I went, oh, look, this isn't about putting the rent up because you would never do it. You just gotta say it's gonna go up. So I knew obviously, it was something a little bit more serious. So she's like, anyway, I'll, I'll come down dear and we have a little discussion. Anyway, she's come down and she goes, someone wants to build a house on the plot and they've offered me a lot of money. And I'm like, well, how much have they offered you? She's like, a lot. And she goes, I know I've always said you've got first refusal, but he's offered a lot. And he's actually a friend of mine. I actually know the guy, but he does development and he's just business. I totally get it. And, uh, <clears throat> I was like, well, I'll put an offer. And she's like, no, he's offered a lot. And I was like, all right. So it got to the point where I was like, what do I do? You know, I love my job. Every day I get up, I'm, I'm never like, oh, I've got to go to work. I love it. I love fishing, I love selling. It goes hand in hand. So I, I had a few options. I could have either folded my company, closed it down, sold the stock on like I used to, get a lock up and then just go back to that life. And then what do I do? But I think more importantly is you have responsibilities. So I had staff and one's my age, one's younger. And I felt that, you know, they're depending on me. I can't just throw the towel in. I, I could have easily just gone, I'll close, I've, had a, I've had a great run, see you later. But we did have a good business. We, we made money. We had some fantastic customers. Um, 
and we were busy, but for the size of the shop, we were a good shop. So it was by chance that this place come up. So a friend of mine had got a place just around the corner and he said that this place is going to be developed on. Um, you should have a look at it. And obviously <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll go and have a look. So then I went, came here for the first time and I was just like, it's four times bigger than my old shop. What the hell? But it's like anything in life. If you want it, you've just got to go for it. Doesn't matter what it is. And, and again, you know, the most important thing for me is the same as back in the old days, you know, originally a year I got a loan to, to go and buy the shop, but then I paid the loan off and then I had a bit of money. Then you buy a bit to sell a bit and make a bit and blah, blah, blah. That's how it works. So when I moved into my previous shop, I'd done it all off, all off my cuff, you know, grafted to buy stock to get it on, you know. And it was the same as this, it was like starting all over again, only four times the size. So yeah, that's, that's what we've done. We just literally grafted night and day to produce, in my opinion, one of the best shops in the South, certainly. We are mad keen predator anglers in here. Ricard and I absolutely love chucking bits of plastic around, which was the idea behind this lure tank. If you imagine, a bag of boilies off the shelf, a kilo bag is 12 pounds. We sell them hand over fist, right? And people grab a bag of boilies, they throw it in the lake, and you're never gonna get them back out again. When you get a lure like this, this one in particular is 15 pounds, people begrudgingly don't wanna pay for it. Even though you can cast it and cast it and cast it and use it again and again and again, unlike boilies where you just throw in the lake. So the idea is that we had this lure tank built so you can grab one of these lures, and we've got lures that go up to 30 quid, and just have a little cast with them, and you can see how, I mean, this, this is literally like a live fish swimming in the tank. So you can sort of try before you buy. We've got an assortment of lures out, different styles, paddle tails, curly tails. This is a line through. Look how realistic it is. It's crazy, it's like a real fish. And once people see that, then they can see why these lures are the price that they are, instead of just a bit of plastic in a bit of packaging. I mean, come on. What pike can resist that? There isn't none. So previously, before I had my shop, I was a free man, you know, I could literally, everything was here. It's all here, isn't it? So you could literally just take an order, did, 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 got that order, did, process it go to my lock-up every other day. I even used to go to the lock-up, pack a load of parcels, however many parcels I had, 50, 60, 100, whatever it was, and then just give them to my mum. I go, see you later, car's loaded, and I'll be straight to the lake. And, and I was fishing, like I say, two, two lakes at the same time, and just catching loads of fish. You know, fishing a park lake, which was full of big urns, and somewhere else, which was a little bit special, for some nicer carp. And it was the life of Riley, but obviously, going back to having staff and, and, and spending all your time. It was, the th when was it? The 30th of June was the last time I went carp fishing and my shop opened on April the 5th. And it was a long, long, long time before I got the rods out again. You haven't got time to think about going angling, which is really difficult because you're surrounded by anglers. Your clientele are people who are going fishing, been fishing, you know, but I used to buzz off that. So especially if you advise someone on something and they'd come into the store and go, oh, mate, I just caught that and whatever. That, that's a buzz. But the, the thing is as well with me is I'm a yes man. So uh, one of my good friends, Ben, he, he would go, mate, do you fancy going up to St. Ives and fishing the lagoon for the lady? I'm like, yeah, of course. The reality is, looking back now, I didn't have the time to do that. No way. I had a girlfriend and more importantly, I had my work, which just demanded full power because we haven't got loads of money in the bank and everything you do is off your own back. You know, it's, it's like anything. The harder you work, the more you get out of it. So I didn't have that free time. So yeah, I'd go up to St. Ives. Pointless. Do you know what I mean? I was doing like a couple of times done overnighters. So from here, it's like a two and a quarter, two and a half hour slap drive up to Cambridge, past Cambridge, get the rods out, and then five in the morning, reel your rods in, jump in your car, drive back down, you know, the M25 and back to work to open up the shop for half eight in the morning. I never learn, I mean, you know, the, 
there's loads of tickets that I had that regrettably now, and I'm not even talking as far as, as uh, Cambridge, you know, St. Ives, there's local waters around here where I wish I could sort of time, manage my time better and fish some local waters because, you know, you, you look at the Larkfield complexes and stuff like that. Again, fishing with my friends, they done very well and caught some amazing carp. And I was sort of like, caught nice fish, but nowhere near what they caught. And I'm gutted because those carp aren't around anymore. And obviously, I love them fish. They're, you know, they're irreplaceable. The same as Roach Pit. Roach Pit was like a classic example. So, Alan Cooper, a good friend of mine, he's got the Roach Pit and we fished there. And again, I, I, what did I do? I'm gonna guess and say 18 nights over three years, which is no time, no time at all, especially going by the stock that they had. And then what happens, you know, those fish, majority of those fish aren't with us. So now I look back and go, oh man, I wish I'd done more time or, or, or maybe planned my time better. But when your hand's forced to work and, and like I say, when you're committed onto something like work, you want the best out of your company, your best out of your business, you know, you work 24 seven. Sometimes when you get to a lake, your mind's not on it anyway. And it's the same as having girl troubles, I suppose. If you've got your missus giving you earache, you know, you don't fish effectively, no one does. And when you've got work problems and stuff like that and you're trying to battle through it, you definitely don't fish to your full potential. But I do regret, there's a handful of waters that I do regret with some amazing carp that I just wish I'd just done more time on and capitalise and try and put some of those fish in the photos. But thankfully now, you know, those days, even though we, it's like we started again, I've got a really good team behind me now and I've certainly made time to go fishing more. I think it's very important because why did I start this business in the first place? Was it because I like selling? No, I could go into a a car showroom and, and sell you a four whatever. But it's the fact that it goes hand in hand. I like selling, I like talking to people, I like being friendly, I like the rapport. But most importantly, my passion started as a kid all those years ago for angling. And that's, that's why I do it.